My name is Dirk Marlen. Um, I'm coming from Germany from a company, uh, the name is Buschmais. For those who are German guys, this name might sound a bit strange. What we are doing, we are consultants. We are working as software developers, engineers, architects, testers in projects for our customers. And I am actually working as a Java developer. And I'm a human guy. I make mistakes, as you might have seen right now. I was sitting in the wrong room beside there. <laughs> Uh, and I, I'm doing mistakes. Because I'm accepting that, I need feedback from other guys, from the business people who tell me, no, you did that wrong, I need that button there, and it needs that functionality. But for the technical aspects of what I'm developing, I'm using software analytic tools in my build chain to break the build if something goes wrong. Like check style, if you're coming from the Java world, like PMD, like Findbugs, like the Maven Enforcer plugin, and much more. They're very valuable, they provide me the feedback I need, but there's something missing with them. The first thing, uh, what all those tools do have, they have a tunnel vision. They are only focusing on a very specific, let's say, technology or aspect. For instance, if you take a look at CheckStyle, it gives you wonderful feedback about missing Java doc, wrong formattings in your source code, and so on. Find bugs, find some very nice patterns about null pointers which are possible at some point, at some line numbers and this stuff. But if you, you, if you take a look at the projects you are doing, this, that's a mix of technologies you do have. You're working with the build system, you have XML descriptors, you have YAML files, JSON descriptors, whatever. And sometimes it's necessary to connect these information uh, to, to, to get uh, to find errors. I will get, come back on that later. The second is, and this is quite annoying, if you take a look at those tools, they come with predefined set of rules. You can say, I want to activate that rule, I want to activate that, that, that rule, I don't need that rule. You might be able to make the parameterize these rules to change a bit of their behavior, but there are very often situations um, where you, where you need uh, your own set of rules, you want to express your own things, like naming rules, for instance, so that some things should be located in special folders or something like that. If you find a tool that helps you, especially on the level of design and architecture, you get into another problem. If those tools provide rules for managing architecture, for structuring packages, for placing elements in those packages in the Java world, they are very often very opinionated. They, they tell you, you need to do layers and you need to, to structure your packages that way and place that classes in that, in that place. That's a bit too, too strict for me. I want more flexibility. The second thing is, you can even do architectural management with tools like CheckStyle. CheckStyle allows, for instance, um, specifying if I do have a couple of, of, of packages or classes, they might depend on another set of classes or, or packages and things like that. But what you are doing is you're talking about packages. If you're taking a look at that rules, you see packages, but there's something behind that usually. Things like modules, layers, or components, or entities, services, controllers, if you're speaking about Java classes. Sorry if this is too focused on Java, but I hope you understand what, what, what the concepts I'm talking about. And even, if I wanted to add new rules to those tools, they very often come with very close data models. I cannot add just something I need. And even if I want to do that, I sometimes have to struggle with very strange technologies. Strange technologies like XPath, if you're using SonarCube and uh, adding Java rules. And I f for, mis for me, this is really strange. So that's why I'm going now the next step. Uh, some years ago, with the help of the Neo4j guys, especially Michael Hunger, some of you might know him, uh, I initiated a project called JQ Assistant. It has something to do with quality assurance, it wants to help you, and it's based on Java, but it's not limited to Java. It's based, as you can imagine, on Neo4j, and I want to give you the idea what it does. Software somehow represents structures, and there are scanners, which scan those structures, which store the information about the structures in the database. You can execute queries. Why should you, would you do that? For instance, for exploring existing structures. 
two weeks ago, ago uh, at the bank, I just did an analysis if there are backdoors in an application to see what are the communication patterns, the communication technologies used by that application. You can enrich the graph, the data, with higher level concepts, and you can find constraint violations. If you have some rules which you treat as constraints, you can do that by just executing queries. And if you automate that, you can also create reports out of that. What are the benefits of modeling software as a graph? First of all, I already mentioned, mentioned it, the data is connected. We are leaving, working in islands, we are connecting the data. It's extensible. We start with Java, we add information from the build system, we add property files, and at the next day, we need some dynamic information, tracing from call graphs, we just add it to the graph. And we always tell that it's in, the graph is a natural model. You take a look at it, you understand it. Let's give an example for that. Starting with the build system. A very popular build system in the Java universe is Maven. We have a Maven project that creates an artifact, a VAR archive, for instance. That archive contains an XML file, CDI for the Java enterprise guys, that has an interceptor, which is a Java class, and the Java class declares methods. We have three worlds connected to each other. It's Maven, the build system, it's some XML stuff, uh, it's the Java class. All in one, you can execute queries over that. And this allows, this openness of the graph allows a plugin architecture for that tool. So the JQ system, the tool itself, is just a framework for plugins, adding other language concepts. It's accessible. It's not a closed data model. We are writing Cypher, a very expressive query language. A Maven project creates a web artifact. The web artifact, the var contains a Beans XML, which has an interceptor and uh, of a, a specific Java, a Java type, and the Java type declares a method. We can write it, we can read it. A second aspect is the graph is by nature multidimensional. What do I mean with that? We can also scan whole software repositories, artifacts, with artifacts which have been deployed there. For instance, that web artifact that we do have, that we did have on the slides before, that contain a Java types, for instance, or the script or whatever you need. But this repository could also contain an artifact in an older version with an older version of that class. And if we have some idea how these relate to each other, we can add, for instance, relations as predecessor on both levels, and we can find differences between them. For instance, has there been any interface changes for such Java types? We can do an analysis on that in multiple dimensions, still containing the level of detail from the static view we had before. And one of the most powerful things, I think, is it's, you can add concrete information to the graph. That is, this is the raw data we already had in the graphs, but also abstract data. Let's give an example. Do we know the concept of annotations in Java? You have a Java class, and you can put an annotation out there which gives it a role, this class. For instance, an entity which maps to persistent data structures. I have a Java class which is annotated by an annotation of a certain type, Java X persistence entity, for instance. You can execute Cypher queries saying, OK, if I find such a pattern uh, where the annotation is Java X persistence entity, I just set two labels on the node. Very easy, very simple, but that allows something more, uh, um, a more abstract view on the data I have. What happens in that case? Just two more labels. In the context of JQ Assistant, we call this a concept, because this usually is a concept of your application, its entities. But it could also be some things like controllers or services or whatever. Based on these concepts, you can create so-called constraints. Now you can say, give me all packages that contain entities where the name is not model. That's a violation. If you have a coding rule saying, I want all entities in a model package. That's a constraint. A bit more abstract, a bit more focused to architecture, give me all the Spring services, which somehow depend on other Spring types, where the other Spring types are not services or repositories, and give me that as, as a violation, as wrong dependencies. So you can check your architecture. You, could, you can do that on classes, packages, <laughs> even Maven modules, whatever you want to have. So the rules we have are just Cypher queries, expressive Cypher queries, which are based on abstract concepts. 
You're writing that in that notation, that's the query, adding some metadata based on the concept, a description, an identifier, and we write that as ASCII doc. ASCII doc? Sounds like markdown, markup language. Oh, that's cool. It's a documentation for developers. It's coding guidelines, which are actually rules. You don't have that gap that there's some coding guidelines in the wiki, which is much older than the current state of the code. You can render that to HTML. So, this was the lighting talk, a short wrap up. What you get by scanning software structures into a graph database is a very holistic and extensible view on the code structure and on the system architecture. You can explore existing structures just by doing queries. You can gather metrics, for instance. Uh, you can validate your application on the fly using abstract concepts, concepts which you can define yourself from the design and architecture language. And you put those rules in the developer documentation for closing the gap between documentation and what your code is. Thanks a lot. I hope it wasn't too fast. It wasn't, uh, um, yeah, you could get the idea. If I could place some bit of curiosity in your minds, I'm here around all the day. Uh, just look for the T-shirt uh, and I would be happy to get into a conversation with you and show you, for instance, a demo, what you can do with that. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice day at GraphConnect.